Okay. Hello and welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar for um, October. So I'm just going to go over the agenda. I'm going to do a brief introduction. Then um, there will be the workshop by Hugo and James. And you can ask questions along the way in the chat. Or actually, the best place to ask questions is the Q&A. And there's an option to upvote as well. Um, so yeah, um, ask in the Q&A. If you happen to post it on the chat by mistake, I can also transfer it over to Q&A. So that would be fine too. And this webinar is being recorded. Uh, briefly about me, I am a statistician and data scientist, and I am the founder of Data Umbrella. Um, I am on a lot of platforms as Reshma S, so feel free to follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. We have a code of conduct. Uh, we're dedicated to providing harassment-free experience for everyone. Um, thank you for helping to make this a welcoming, friendly, professional community for all. And this code of conduct applies to the chat as well. Um, so our mission is to provide an inclusive community for underrepresented persons in data science. We are an all-volunteer run organization. You can support Data Umbrella by doing the following things. You can follow our code of conduct and keep our community um, a place where everybody wants to keep coming to. Um, you can donate to our open collective and that helps to pay meetup dues and other operational costs. And um, you can check out this link here on GitHub. Um, we have this new initiative where all the videos are being transcribed. And so um, it's to make them more accessible. So we take the YouTube videos and we put the raw there. And so we've had a number of volunteers help us transcribe it. So feel free to check out this link. And maybe if you do this video, maybe the two speakers will follow you on Twitter. I can't promise anything, but it's possible. Um, Data Umbrella has a job board and it's at jobs.dataumbrella.org and once this gets started I'll put some links in the chat. The job that we are highlighting today is, is the machine learning engineer job by Development Seed and Development Seed is based in Washington DC and Lisbon, Portugal and they do, um, I'm going to go to the next slide. What they do is they're doing um, social good work. And so they're doing, for instance, mapping elections from Afghanistan to the US, analyzing public health and economic data from Palestine to Illinois, and leading the strategy and development behind Data World Bank and some other organizations. And I will share a link to their job posting in the chat as well, um, as soon as I finish this brief introduction. Uh, check out our website for resources. There's a lot of resources on learning Python um, and R, also for contributing to open source, also for guides on accessibility and responsibility and allyship. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out towards the end of the month and it has information on our upcoming events. We have two great events coming up in November and December on open source. So subscribe to our newsletter um, to, to be in the know. Um, we are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. Um, Meetup is the best place to join to find out about upcoming events. Our website has resources. Follow us on Twitter. We also share um, a lot of information on LinkedIn. And if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, we record all of our talks and post them there um, within about a week of the talk. So it's a good way to get information. Okay. And now we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to um, I'll put myself on mute and I will hand it over to Hugo and James and let you take over. Thank you all for joining. I just want to thank Reshma, um, Christina and, and everyone else who tied all the tireless effort that that goes into putting um, these meetups and these online sessions together. I, I think um, one thing I want to say is actually the the last in-person workshop I gave, either at the end of February or early March, um, was Data Umbrella's in inaugural tutorial and, and meetup, if I if I recall correctly, on on, on Bayesian Bayesian thinking and um, hacker statistics and simulation and that type of stuff. So it's it's just wonderful to to be back, particularly with um my, my colleague and friend friend James. We're building really cool um distributed uh, data science products um, at, at Coiled. We'll say a bit about that. Um, but we'll do some introductions in, in a bit. I just wanted to 
um, get you all accustomed to, it was February, thank you, Reshma. Um, uh, we're working um, with uh, Jupyter Notebooks in a GitHub repository. The repository is pinned uh, to the top of the chat. This is um, what it looks like. These are all the files. This is the file system. Um, now, we use something called Binder, uh, which is a project um, out of and related to Project Project Jupyter, which provides infrastructure to run um, notebooks without any local installs. So there are two ways you can, you can code along on this tutorial. The first is, and I won't get you to do this yet, um, is to launch Binder. The reason I won't get you to do that yet is because once you launch it, we have 10 minutes to start coding or the Binder session times out. And I've been burnt by that before. Um, actually, several times. I'm surprised I even remembered it th this time. The other thing you can do is install everything locally by cloning the repository, downloading Anaconda, creating a Conda environment. Um, if you haven't done that, um, I, I suggest you do not do that now and you uh, launch, launch the binder. Um, James is going to start by telling us a few, um, a few things about, uh, about Dask and distributed compute in, in general. My question for you, James, is if we get people to launch this now, will we get to execute a cell co uh, a code cell in 10 minutes? Um, I would, let's hold off for now. Maybe, yep. maybe I'll indicate when we should uh, launch Binder. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Um, and just for, so, for reference, what I'm looking at right now is the GitHub repository on your browser. Yes. Great. Exactly. So I will not launch Binder now. I will not get you to now. I've, I'm doing this locally. Um, and we see that I'm in uh, notebook zero. And if you want to actually have a look at this notebook before launching Binder, it's in the notebooks data umbrella uh, subdirectory and it's notebook uh, zero. And we're going to hopefully make it through the overview, then chatting about dask, dask delayed um, and, and data frame and, and machine learning. Um, great. So we have, uh, Hashim has said you could open it in, in VS Code as well. You, you could, I mean, that would require all your local installs and, and, and that, that type of stuff as well. Um, but uh, we're to introduce uh, me and James. Um, we, we work at, at Coiled, um, where we uh, build products for distributed compute in infrastructure. As we'll see, one of the big problems with like bursting to the cloud is all the like Kubernetes, AWS, Docker stuff. So we build our one-click hosted deployments for Dask, but for data science and machine learning in, in general. Um, James maintains Dask um, along with Matt, Matt Rocklin, um, who created Dask uh, with a team, people who was working with it, Continuum, Anaconda at, at the time. Um, and uh, James is a software engineer at, at Coiled, and I run data science evangelism and marketing. Work on a bunch of product product stuff as well. Um, wear a bunch of different different hats uh, occasionally. Um, there are many ways to think about uh, distributed compute and how to do it in, in Python. We're going to present, um, hey James, you're muted. I'm taking it I went away based on what I see in the chat. You, you did, you did, but okay. now we're back. I've introduced you, I've introduced me. I've mentioned that there are many ways to do distributed compute. Um, in, in the Python ecosystem. And we'll be chatting about one called Dask. Um, and maybe I'll pass to you in a second, but I'll say one thing that I really like about, my background isn't in distributed compute. My background's in Pythonic data science. Um, when thinking about bursting to larger data sets and larger models, there are a variety of options. The thing that took me, uh, attracted me to Dask uh, originally, I saw Cameron's note, the ghosts in the machine aren't playing nice tonight. Ain't that, ain't that the truth? Um, is that Dask plays so nicely with the entire PyData ecosystem. So as we'll see, if you wanna write Dask code for data frames, Dask data frames, it really mimics your Pandas code. Um, same with NumPy, same with scikit-learn, okay? Um, the other thing is Dask essentially runs the Python code under the hood. So your mental model of what's happening is actually corresponds to the code um, being, um, being executed, okay? Um, now I'd like to pass over to James, but it looks like he's disappeared again. I'm, um, I'm still here, if you can hear me. I've just turned my oh. camera off. Oh yeah, okay, great. I'm gonna um, turn my camera off, hopefully that will help. <laughs> yeah, and I might do, do the same for bandwidth, bandwidth issues. So if, if you wanna jump in and, and talk about Dask at, at a high level, um, I'm sharing my screen and we can scroll through. Yeah, that sounds great. So um, Dask sort of, uh, in a nutshell, you can think of it 
as being composed of two main uh, uh, well components. The first we call uh, collections. These are the user interfaces that you use to actually um, uh, construct a computation you would like to compute in parallel or on distributed hardware. Um, there are a few different interfaces that Dask implements. Uh, for instance, there's Dask Array for doing ND array computations. There's Dask Data Frame for working with tabular data. You can think of those as like Dask Array as a parallel version of NumPy, Dask Data Frame as a parallel version of Pandas, and, and so on. There are also a couple other um, interfaces that uh, we'll be talking about. Dask Delayed, for instance, we'll talk about that today. We'll also talk about the Futures API. Those are sort of for lower level uh, custom algorithms. Um, in sort of paralyzing existing uh, existing code. Uh, the main takeaway is that there are several sort of familiar APIs that Dask implements and that we'll use today to actually construct your computation. So that's the first part of Dask. It is these Dask collections. You then take these collections, uh, uh, set up your steps for your computation, and then pass them off to uh, the second component, which are Dask schedulers. Um, and these will actually go through and execute your computation potentially in parallel. There are two flavors of schedulers that Dask offers. The first is a, are, are, are called single machine schedulers. And these just take advantage of your local hardware. They will spin up a, um, uh, a local thread or process pool and start submitting tasks in your computation to, the, to be executed in a parallel, um, either on multiple threads or multiple processes. There's also a distributed scheduler, or um, maybe uh, a better term for it would actually be called the advanced scheduler, because it works well on a single machine, but it also scales out to uh, multiple machines. So for instance, as you'll see later, we will actually spin up a uh, distributed scheduler that uh, has workers on uh, remote machines on AWS. So you can actually scale out beyond your local resources, like say what's on your laptop. Um, Kind of scrolling down then to the image of the uh, uh, cluster, we can see the main components of the distributed scheduler. And James, so, I might get people to spin up the binder now because we're going to execute yeah, codes. Yeah, now's a good uh, point. Yep. So just here's a quick break point before, you know, a teaser for um, the schedulers and what's happening there. I'll ask you to, um, in the repository, there's also the link to the binder. Click on Launch Binder. I'm going to open it in a new tab. And what this will create is an environment um, in which you can just execute the code in, in the notebooks, OK? Um, so hopefully, by the time we've gotten, gotten through this section, um, this will be ready to start executing code. So if everyone wants to do that, to code along. Otherwise, just watch. Or if you're running things locally, also cool. Thanks, James. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks, Hugo. Um, so, so yeah, looking at the image uh, for the distributed scheduler, we're not going to have time to go into the um, a lot of detail about the distributed scheduler in this workshop. So, but we do want to provide at least a high level overview of the the different parts and components of the distributed scheduler. Um, so, the first part I want to talk about is in the diagram what's labeled as a client. Um, so, this is the user facing entry point to a cluster. So. Um, wherever you are running your Python session, that could be in a Jupyter Lab session like we are here, that could be in a, a Python script somewhere, um, you will create and instantiate a client object that connects to the second component, which is the Dask scheduler. So each Dask cluster um, has a single scheduler in it that sort of uh, keeps track of all of the state for all of the, uh, for the state of your cluster and all the tasks you'd like to compute. So from your client, you might start submitting tasks to the cluster. The scheduler will receive those tasks and compute things like all the dependencies needed for that task. Like say you're uh, implementing, you say you want to compute task C, but that actually requires, first you have to compute task B and task A. Like there are some dependency structures there. It'll compute those dependencies as well as keep track of them. Um, it'll also, uh, communicate with all the workers to understand what worker is working on which task. And um, as space frees up on the workers, it will start farming out uh, new tasks to compute to the workers. Um, so in this particular diagram, there are three Dask distributed workers here. Um, however, you can have as you can have thousands of workers if you'd like. Um, so the workers are the things that actually compute the tasks. They also store the results of your tasks and then serve them back to you in the client. Um, the scheduler basically manages all the state needed to uh, uh, 
perform the computations um, and you submit tasks from the client. So that's sort of a uh, quick whirlwind tour of the different components for the distributed scheduler. Um, and at this point, I think it'd, it'd be great to actually see, see some of this in action. Um, Hugo, would you like to take over? Absolutely. Thank you for that wonderful introduction to Dask and, and, and the schedulers in, in particular. And we are going to see that um, with Dask in action. Uh, I'll just note that this tab um, in which I um, launched a binder is up and running. If you're going to execute code here, click on notebooks, click on data umbrella, um, oop, and then go to the overview uh, notebook. And you can drag around. We'll see the utility of these, these dashboards in a second, but you can, you know, drag your stuff around to, to make, you know, however you want to want to structure it. And then you can execute code in here. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to do this uh, locally at, at the moment. Um, but just to see Dust in action to, to begin with, uh, I'm going to, I'm actually going to uh, restart kernel and clear my outputs. Um, so I'm going to import uh, from Dust distributed the client. The, sorry, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is um, we made a decision around content for this. We do have a notebook that we, we love to teach on schedulers, but we decided to switch that out for machine learning for this workshop in particular. We are, are teaching a similar, um, although distinct workshop um, at PyData Global. So we may see some of you there in which we'll be going um, more in depth in, into schedulers as, as well. Um, so if you wanna check that out, definitely do. So we instantiate the client, which as James mentioned, is kind of what we work with as the user um, to submit our code. Um, so that will take take a, a few seconds. Um, okay, it's got a port in use, so it's going, going elsewhere. What I'll just um, first uh, get you to notice is that it tells us where our dashboard is, um, and we'll see those tools in a second, it tells us about our cluster that we have four workers, eight cores, um, between eight and nine gigs of, of, of RAM, okay? Um, now, this is something I really love about Dask, all the diagnostic um, tools. If I click on the little Dask thing here, and we've um, modified the binder so that uh, that exists there as well, um, we can see, I'll hit search and it should, that now corresponds to the, the scheduler. Now, I wanna look at the task stream, which will tell us in real time what's happening. I also wanna look at the cluster map so we see um, here, this is already really cool. Um, we've got uh, all of our workers uh, uh, around here and our scheduler scheduler there. And when we start um, uh, doing some compute, we'll actually see information flowing between these. Um, and the other thing maybe I'll, yeah, I'll include a little progress. Um, and that can be an alternate tab to um, ask. Um, I'm wondering, perhaps I also want to include something about the workers. Yeah, okay, great. So we've got a bunch of stuff um, that's, that's pretty interesting there. Um, and so the next thing I'm gonna do, we've got a little utility file which um, downloads some of the data. And this is, what it does is if um, you're in Binder, it downloads a subset of the data. If you're um, anywhere else, it downloads a larger set. Um, for this particular example, we're dealing with a small data set. You see the utility of, of Dask and distributed compute when it generalizes to larger data sets. But for pedagogical purposes, um, we're going to stick with a smaller data set so that we can actually run, run the code. There's a trade off there. Um, so actually, that was already uh, downloaded, it, it seems, but you should all see it download. I'm actually going to run that in the binder just to should start seeing downloading NYC flight data set, done, extracting, creating JSON data, etc. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to read in um, this data as a Dask data frame. And I, what I want you to notice is that it really, the Dask code mimics pandas code. So instead of PD read CSV, we've got DD read CSV. Um, we've got, you know, this is the file path, the, the first argument. We're doing some parse dates, setting some data types. Okay, um, we've got a little um, wildcard regular expression there to, to join, uh, uh, to do a bunch of them. Um, and then we're performing a group by, okay? So we're grouping by the origin of these flight, flight data. We're looking at the, the mean departure delay group by origin. The, the one difference I wanna make clear is that in Dask, we need a compute method. Um, that's because Dask performs uh, lazy computation. It won't actually do anything 
because you don't want it to do anything on really large data sets until you explicitly tell it, tell it to compute. So I'm going to execute this now, and uh, we should see some information transfer between the scheduler and, and the workers, and we should see tasks starting, starting to be done. Okay, so moment of truth. Fantastic. So we call this a pew pew plot because we see pew pew pew. Um, we saw a bunch of data transfer happening between them. These are all our cores and we can see tasks happening. Um, it tells us what tasks there are. We can see that most of the time was spent uh, reading reading CSVs. Then we have some um, group buys on chunks and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, so that's a, a really nice uh, diagnostic tool to see what most of your work um, is, is actually doing. Uh, under task workers, you can see memory use, CPU use, um, uh, more fine grained examples there. Um, so I, I'd love to know if um, in the Q and A, um, I'm going to ask, were you able to execute this code? And if you were in Binder, just a, a thumb up, a, a vote would be would be fantastic. Um, much appreciated. Um, so as we've mentioned, I just wanted to say a, a, a few things about tutorial goals. Um, the goal is to cover the basics of, of Dask and distributed compute. We'd love for you to walk away with an understanding of when to use it, when to not, what it has to offer. We're going to be covering um, the basics of Dask delayed, which although not immediately um, applicable to data science, provides a, a wonderful framework um, for thinking um, about Dask, how Dask works and understanding how it works under the hood. Then we're going to go into Dask data frames and then machine learning, hopefully. Um, due to the technical um, considerations, we've, um, we've, we've got less time than, than we thought we would, but um, we'll, we'll definitely do the best we can. Um, we may have less time to do uh, exercises. So we've had two people who were able to execute this code. Um, if, you, if you tried to execute it in Binder and were not able to, perhaps post that in the Q&A. Um, but... Um, we also have several exercises, um, and I'd like you to take a minute just to do this exercise. The, I, I'm, I'm not asking you to do this because I want to know if you're able to print Hello World. I'm essentially asking you to do it um, so you get a sense of how these exercises work. So if you can take 30 seconds to print Hello World, um, then uh, we'll, we'll move on after that. So just take um, 30 seconds now. And it seems like we have a few more people who are able to execute code, which, which was great. Okay, fantastic. So you will have put your solution there. For some reason, I have um, an extra cell here, so I'm just gonna clip that. Um, and to see a solution, uh, I'll just get you to execute uh, this cell and it provides the solution and then we can execute it and compare it to the, the output of what you had. Okay, hello world. Um, so as, as we saw, I've done all this locally. You may have done it on Binder. Um, there is an option to work directly from the cloud um, and I'll, 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 I'll take you through this. There are many ways to do this. As I mentioned, we're working on one way with Coil and I'll, I'll explain the rationale behind that in, in in a second, but I'll show you how easy it is to get uh, a cluster up and running on, on AWS without even interacting with a AWS, for, for, for example. Um, you can follow along by uh, signing into uh, Coiled Cloud. To be clear, this is not a necessity and it does involve you signing up to our product. So I just wanted to be absolutely transparent about that. It does not involve any credit card information or anything uh, along those lines. And in my opinion, it does give a really nice uh, e example of how to run stuff on the cloud. Um, to do so, you can sign in um, at cloud.coiled.io. Uh, you can also pip install coiled and then uh, do authentication. You can also spin up this uh, this hosted coiled notebook. So I'm going to spin that up now and I'm going to post that here. Um, actually, yep, I'm gonna post that in the ch chat. Um, if you, let me get this right. Um, if you've if you've never logged in to Cold before, it'll ask you to sign up using Gmail or, or GitHub. So feel free to do that if you'd like. Um, if not, that's also also cool. Um, but I just wanted to be explicit uh, about that. 
Um, the reason I want to do this is to show how DAS can be leveraged to do work on really large data sets. So you will recall that I had between eight and nine gigs of RAM on my local system. Um, oh, wow, Anthony says on iPad, unable to execute on Binder. In incredible. Um, I don't have a, a strong sense of how Binder works on iPad. I do know that I was able to um, to check, to use a Binder on my iPhone several years ago on my way to SciPy doing code review for someone, for Eric Maher, I think, for what that that's worth. Um, but back to this. Um, we have this NYC taxi data set, which is over 10 gigs. It won't even, I can't even store that in local memory. I don't have enough RAM to store that. So we do need um, either to do it uh, locally in an out of core mode of some sort, or we can we can burst to the cloud. And we're actually gonna burst to the cloud using, using Coiled. Um, so the notebook uh, is running here. Um, for me, and but I'm gonna, actually going to do it uh, from my local local notebook. But you'll see, and once again, feel free to code along here. It's spinning up a notebook, and James, who is is my co-instructor here, um, is to be. I'm I'm so grateful for all the work he's done on our notebooks in Coiled. You can launch the cluster here and then analyze the entire um, over 10 gigs of data there. I'm going to do it um, here. So to do that, I import Coiled. Um, and then I import the Dust distributed stuff. Um, and then I can create my own software environment, cluster configuration. I'm not gonna do that um, because the standard coiled um, cluster configuration of software environment works. Now I'm gonna spin up a cluster and instantiate a client. Now, because we're spinning up a cluster uh, in, in the cloud, um, it'll, take, it'll take a minute, a minute or two, um, enough time to make a cup of coffee, but it's also enough time for me to just talk a bit about um, why this is important. Um, and there are a lot of, a lot of good, good people working on, on, on similar things. Um, but part of the motivation here is that if you want to, you don't always want to do distributed data science. Okay. Um, first I'd, I'd ask you to look at instead of using Dask, if you can optimize your pandas code, right? Um, second, I'd ask if you've got big data sets, it's a good question. Do you actually need all the data? So, I would, if you're doing machine learning, plot your learning curve, see how accurate, see how your accuracy um, or whatever your metric of interest is improves as you increase the amount of data, right? Um, and if it plateaus before you get to a large data size, then you may as well, most of the time, use your small data. Um, see if subsampling um, can actually give you the results you need. Um, see if you can get a bigger, bigger access to a bigger machine so you don't have to uh, burst to the cloud. But after all these things, if you do need to boast, burst to the cloud, until recently, you've had to get an AWS account. Um, you've had to you know, set up containers with Docker and or Kubernetes um, and do all of these kind of, I suppose, DevOpsy, software engineering foo stuff, um, which, which if you're into that, I, I absolutely encourage you, encourage you to do that. Um, but a lot of working data scientists aren't paid to do that um, and um, aren't don't necessarily want to. Um, so that's something we're working on is thinking about these kind of one click hosted deployments. So you don't have to do all, all of that. Um, having said that, um, I very much encourage you to try doing that stuff if, if you're interested. Um, we'll see that the, the um, cluster has just been created. Um, and what I'm going to do, we see that, um, oh, I'm sorry. I've done something funny here. I'm, I'm referencing the previous client, aren't I, James? Yeah, it looks like you should go ahead and connect a new client to the coil cluster. And Ma making sure not to re-execute the cluster creation yeah, line. Yeah, exactly. So would that be, how would I, what's the call here? I would just open up a new cell. And I've say client yep. equals um, capital client, uh, and then pass in the cluster. Like open exactly. parentheses, cluster, yeah. Great. Okay, fantastic. And what we're seeing is a slight version. This We don't need to worry about this. This is essentially saying that um, the environment on the cloud, uh, miss, is, there's a slight mismatch with my, with my local environment. We're fine with that. I'm going to... Um, look here, for a certain reason, um, the, the dashboard isn't quite working here at the moment. James, would you suggest I just click on this and open a new? 
Yeah, I click on the ECS uh, dashboard link. Ah, yes. Fantastic. So, um, yep, there's some bug with the local dashboards that we're, we're, we're currently, currently working on. But what we'll see now, just a sec, I'm going to move all of this. Um, we'll see now that I have access to 10 workers. I have access to 40 cores and I have access to uh, over 170 gigs of, of memory, okay? So now I'm actually going to import this data set and it's the entire um, year of data from 2019. And we'll start seeing on, on the diagnostics all the, all the processing hap happening, okay? So, oh, actually, not yet because we haven't um, called compute, okay? So it's done this lazily. Um, we've imported it. Um, it shows kind of like pandas when you show a data frame, um, the column names and, and data types, um, but it doesn't show uh, the data because we haven't loaded it yet. It does tell you how many partitions it is. So essentially, and we'll see this soon, DAS data frames correspond to collections of pandas data frames. Um, so there are really 127 pandas data frames underlying this DAS data frame. So now I'm going to do the compute, well, I'm going to set myself up for the computation um, to do a group by passenger count and look at the mean tip. Now that took a very small amount of time. We see the IPython magic um, timing there because we haven't computed it. Now we're actually going to compute. Um, and James, if you'll see in the chat, Eliana said her coil, coiled authentication failed. I don't know if you're able to, to help with that, but if you are, that, that would be great. Um, it, may, it may be difficult to de debug in, but look, as we see, we have the task stream now, um, and we see how many, you know, we've got 40 cores working together. We saw the processing, we saw the bytes stored, it's over 10 gigs, as I said. Um, and we see we were able to do our um, basic analytics. Um, we uh, were able to do it on a 10 plus gig uh, data set um, in, in 21.3 seconds, which is pretty, pretty exceptional. Um, um, if any, any code based issues come up, um, and they're correlated in particular. So if you have questions about the code execution, please ask in the Q&A, um, not in the chat, because others can upvote it, and I will de definitively prioritize questions on technical stuff, particularly ones that are, that are upvoted. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Thanks, thanks, Reshma. Um, so yeah, let's jump into, into um, dask, dask data frames. Um, so, of course, we write here that in the last exercise, um, we used Dask delayed to parallelize uh, loading multiple CSV files into a pandas data frame. Um, we're not, we, we haven't done that, but you can definitely go through and have a look at that. Um, but I think perhaps even more immediately relevant for a data science crowd and an analytics crowd, is, which is what I see here from the reasons people, people have joined, um, is, is jumping into Dask data frames. Um, and as I said before, a Dask data frame um, really feels like a, a pandas data frame, um, but internally it's composed of many different different data frames. And this is one one way to think about it: that we have all these pandas data frames, um, and the collection of them is a is a Dask data frame. And as we saw before, they're partitioned. We saw when we loaded the taxi data set in, the Dask data frame was 127 partitions, right? Um, where each partition was a normal panda pandas data frame, um, and they can live on disk as they did early uh, in the first example, Dask in action, or they can live on other machines as when I spun up a coiled cluster and, and did it on, on, on AWS. Um, something I love about Dask data frames, I mean, I ran about this all, all, all the time, um, is how it's the Pandas API. And, and Matt, Matt Rockland actually um, uh, has a a post on, a, on, on the Cold blog called A Brief History of Dask in which he talks about the technical goals of Gar Dask, but also talks about a social goal of Dask, which in Matt's words is to invent nothing. He wanted and the team wanted um, the Dask API to be as comfortable um, and familiar for users as possible. And that's something I really appreciate uh, about it. So um, we see we have element element uh, wise um, operations. We have the our favorite row wise selections. We have loc. 
Um, we have the common aggregations. We saw group buyers before. We have is-ins. We have date time, string excesses. Um, oh, James, we forgot to, I forgot to edit this. I, I, it's, it should be group buy. I don't, I don't know what a, what, a, what a fruit buy is, but that's something um, we'll, we'll make sure in the next iteration to, to get right. At least we got it right there and in the code. Um, but have a look at the DAS data frame API docs to check out what's happening. Um, and a lot of the time, DAS data frames can serve as drop-in replacements for Pandas data frames. The one thing that I just want to make clear, as I did before, um, is that you need to call compute because of the uh, lazy, lazy compute property of, of Dask. So this is wonderful to talk about when to use Dask data frames. So if your data fits in memory, use Pandas. Um, if your data fits in memory and your code doesn't run super quickly, um, I wouldn't go to Dask. I'd try to, I'd do my best to optimize my Pandas code before trying to get gains, gains in efficiency. Um, but Dask itself becomes useful when the data set you want to analyze is larger than your machine's RAM, um, where you normally run into memory errors. And that's what we saw um, with the taxi cab example. The other example that we'll see when we get to um, machine learning is you can do machine learning on a small data set that fits in memory, but if you're building big models or training over uh, like a lot of different hyperparameters or different types of models, um, you, can, you can parallelize that using, using Dask. So there is, you know, you wanna use Dask perhaps in the big data or medium to big data limit, um, as we see here, um, or in the medium to big model limit where training, for example, takes, takes a lot of time, okay? So without further ado, uh, let's get started with Dask data frames. Um, you likely ran this uh, preparation file to get the data in, in the previous um, notebook, but if you didn't, execute that. Um, now we're going to <clears throat> get our file names by doing doing a few joins, and we see our file is a string data NYC flights um, a wildcard uh, to access all of them dot dot csv, and we're going to import our Dask dask.dataframe and read in our Dask data, data frame, um, parsing some dates, setting some, setting some data types, okay? So we'll execute that. We'll see we have 10 partitions. Um, as we noted before, if this was a pandas data frame, we'd see a bunch of entries here. Um, we don't, we see only the column names and the data types of the columns. Um, and the reason is, as we've stated explicitly here, is the Representation of the data frame object contains no data. Um, it's done, Dask has done enough work to read the start of the file um, so that we know a bit about it, some of the important stuff, and infer the column types and, and, and column names and data types, okay? But we don't, once again, we don't, let's say we've got 100 gigs of data, we don't wanna like do this call and suddenly it's reading all that stuff in and doing a whole bunch of compute until we explicitly uh, tell it to, okay? Now this is really cool. If you know a bit of pandas, you'll know that you can. Um, there's an attribute columns which prints out. It's well, it's actually the columns form an index, right? The pandas index uh, object, um, and we get the we get the column names there. Cool. Pandas in Dask form. We can check out the data types as well um, as, as we would in pandas. We see we've got some ints for the day of the week. We've got some floats for departure time. Um, maybe we'd actually. Um, prefer that to be, you know, a date time at some point. We've got some objects, which generally are the most general on, 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 um, objects, so generally strings. Um, um, so that's all pandasy type stuff. In addition, Dask data frames have an attribute um, n partitions, which tells us the number of partitions. And we saw before that that's 10. So I'd expect to see 10 here. Hey, look at that. Um, now, this is something that um, we talk about a lot in the delayed notebook um, is really the task graph. Um, and I don't wanna to say too much about that, but really it, it, it's a um, visual schematic of, of the order in which different types of compute happen, okay? Um, and so the task graph for read CSV tells us what happens when we call compute. And essentially it reads CSV um, 10, 10 times, zero indexed of course, because Python, um, it reads CSV uh, 10 different times into these 10 different pandas, pandas data frames. And if there were group buys or stuff after that, we'd see them happen in, 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 the, in, in the graph there. And we may see an example of this in a second. Um, so once again, as with pandas, 
Um, we're going to view the, the head of the data frame. Great. And we see a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, we, we see the first, first five rows. Um, I'm actually also going to, going to have a look at the, the tail, the final five rows that may take longer. Um, cause it's accessing the, the final. I, um, I, there's a joke, and it may not even be a joke, how much um, data analytics is actually biased by people looking at the first five rows before actually, you know, interrogating the data uh, more more seriously. Um, so how would all of our results look different if um, if our files were ordered in, in, in a different way? That's another conversation for a more philosophical conversation for another time. Um, so now I want to show you some computations with uh, Dask data frames. Okay, so since Dask data frames implement a pandas-like API, um, we can just write our familiar pandas code. So I want to look at the column um, uh, departure delay and look at the maximum of that column. I'm going to call that max delay. So you can see we've got, we're selecting the column and then applying the max method as we would with pandas. Oh, what happened there? gives us some um, uh, Dask Scalar uh, series. Um, and what's happened is we haven't called compute, right? So it hasn't actually done the compute yet. Um, we're going to do compute, but first we're going to visualize the task graph like we did here. And let's try to reason what the task graph would look like, right? So the task graph, first it's going to read in all of these things. Um, and then it'll probably perform this selector on each of these different pandas data frames comprising the DAS data frame. And then it will compute the max of each of those and then do a max on all those maxes. I think that's what I would assume is happening here. Great. So that's what we're, what we're doing. We're reading this. So, we read the first, um, perform the first read CSV, get this DAS data frame, um, get item, I think is that selection. Then we're taking the max. Uh, we're doing the same for all of them. Then we take all of these maxes and aggregate them and then take the max of that. Okay, so that that's essentially what's happening when I call compute, which I'm going to do now. Moment of truth. Okay. So uh, that took around eight seconds and it tells us the max. And I, I'm sorry, let's, let's just get our, some of our dashboards up as well. Um, ha. Huh. I think in this notebook, we are using the single machine scheduler, Hugo. So I don't think we there are. is a dashboard to be seen. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. that, that catch, James. Um, great. Um, is even better. Um, uh, James, we have a question around using Dask for um, reinforcement learning. Can you can, can you speak to that? Um, yeah. So uh, it depends on. So, so I mean, yeah. Short answer: y Yes, you can use Dask to train reinforcement learning models. Um, so there's a package that Hugo will talk about called DaskML that we'll see in um, the next notebook uh, for distributed machine learning um, that paralyzes and, and, and distributes um, some existing models uh, using Dask. So for instance, things like random forest, forests in scikit-learn. Um, so, so yes, you can use Dask to uh, uh, do distributed training for models. I'm not actually sure if DaskML implements any reinforcement learning models in particular, um, but that is certainly something that that can be done. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll build on that by saying we are about to jump into machine learning. Um, I, I don't think, as James said, I don't think it, there's reinforcement learning um, explicitly that, that, that one can do, um, but um, you, of course, can use the Dask scheduler yourself to... Um, you know, to distribute any reinforcement learning stuff you you have as well, and that's actually another another point to make that maybe James can speak to a bit more is that um the Dask team of course built all of these high level collections and, and Dask arrays and, and, and Dask data frames and were pleasantly surprised when you know maybe even up to half the people using Dask came in and were like we love all that but we're going to use the scheduler for our own bespoke use cases right. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the original intention was to like make basically a NumPy, uh, like a parallel NumPy. So that was like the Dask array stuff, like run run NumPy in parallel on your laptop. Um, and and yeah, so in order to do that, we ended up building a distributed scheduler, um, which sort of does arbitrary task uh, computations. So not just things like uh, you know parallel NumPy, but really whatever you'd like to throw at it. And uh, it turns out that ended up being really <laughs> useful for people. Um, and so, yeah, now people use that um, sort of on their own, uh, just using the distributed scheduler to do totally custom algorithms um, in parallel, um, in addition to these like nice collections, like you saw Hugo present the, the DAS data frame um, API is, is you know, the, the same as the Pandas API. So there is this like familiar space you can use things like the high level collections, but you can also run uh, whatever custom, uh, like Hugo said, bespoke computations you might have. Exactly, and it's it's been wonderful to see so many people so many people do that. And the first thing, as we'll see here, the first thing to think about is if if, if you're doing large scale compute, if there's anything you can you know parallelize embarrassingly, as they say, right? So just if you're doing a hyperparameter search, you just run some on one worker and some on the other, and there there's no interaction effect, so you don't need to worry about that. As opposed to if you're trying to do um, you know, train on streaming data where you may require it all to happen on, 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 on the same worker. Okay. Um, yeah. So even think about trying to compute the standard deviation of a, of a, you know, like a univariate data set, right? Um, in, in that case, um, you can't just send, you can't just compute the standard deviation on two workers and then combine the result in some, some way. You need to do something slightly, slightly more nuanced and slightly, slightly clever, more clever. Um, I mean, you still can actually in, in, in that case, but you can't just do it as naively as that. Um, but so now we're talking about parallel and distributed machine learning. We have 20 minutes left. So this is kind of going to be a whirl, whirlwind tour, but um, you know, whirlwinds when safe uh, are exciting and informative. Um, I just want to make clear the material in this notebook is based on the open source content from Dask's tutorial repository, as is a bunch of stuff we've, we've shown you today. Um, the reason we've done that is because they did it so well. So I just want to give a sh shout out to all the Dask contributors, okay? So what we're going to do now is um, just break down machine learning scaling problems into two categories, just review a bit of scikit-learn in passing, um, solve a machine learning problem with single Michelle, single Michelle? Um, I don't know who she is, but single Michelle, wow. Single machine and par parallelism with scikit-learn and joblib then solve an L problem with an ML problem with multiple machines and parallelism using uh, Dask as well. Um, and we won't have time to burst to the cloud, I, I don't think, but you can also play play around with that. Okay. So as I mentioned before, um, when thinking about distributed compute, a lot of people do it when they have large data. They don't necessarily think about the large model limit. Um, and this schematic kind of speaks to that. Um, if you've got a small model that fits in RAM, you don't need to think about distributed compute. If your data size, if your data is larger than your RAM, um, so your compute is RAM bound, then you want to start going to a distributed setting. Or if your model is big and CPU bound, um, such as like large scale hyperparameter searches or like ensemble blended models of like machine learning algorithms, um, whatever it is. And then of course we have the, you know, big data, big model uh, limit where um, distributed compute and Dask is incredibly handy as I'm sure you could uh, imagine, okay? and. That's really what I've what I've gone through here. Um, a bird's eye view of the strategies we think about. Um, for, if it's in memory in the bottom left quadrant, just use scikit-learn or your favorite ML library, um, otherwise known as scikit-learn, um, for me anyway. Um, I was going to make a, a note about XGBoost, but I, but I won't. Um, uh, for large models, uh, you can use Joblib and your favorite scikit-learn estimator. For large data sets, uh, use uh, Dask ML estimators. So we're going to do a whirlwind tour of scikit-learn in, in, in five minutes. We're going to load in some data. Um, so we're, we'll actually generate it. We'll import scikit-learn for our ML algorithm, create an estimator, um, and then check the accuracy of, of the model. Okay. So once again, I'm actually going to um, clear all outputs after restarting the kernel. Okay, so this is a utility function of uh, scikit-learn to create some data sets. So I'm going to make um, a classification data set with um, four features and 10,000 samples and just have a quick view um, of some of it. 
Um, so just a reminder on ML, um, X is the samples matrix. Um, the size of X is um, the number of samples uh, in terms of rows, number of features as, as columns. Um, and then a feature or an attribute is uh, what we're trying to predict uh, essentially, okay? Um, so Y um, is the predictor variable, uh, which we're, we're uh, um, which we're, or the target variable, which we're trying to predict. So let's have a quick view of Y. It's zeros and ones in, in this case. Okay, so um, yeah, that's what I've said here. Y are the targets, which are real numbers for regression tasks or integers for classification or any other discrete sets of values. Um, no words about unsupervised learning at the moment. We're just going to support, we're going to uh, fit a support vector classifier for this example. Um, so let's just load uh, the appropriate scikit-learn uh, module. Um, we don't really need to discuss what um, support vector classifiers are at the moment. Now, this is one of the very beautiful things about the scikit-learn API um, in terms of uh, fitting the, the model. We instantiate um, a classifier and we want to fit it to the features with respect to the target, okay? So the first argument is the features, second argument is the target um, variable. So we've done that. Um, now I'm not going to uh, worry about inspecting the learned features. Um, I just wanna see how accurate it was, okay? And once we see how accurate it was, I'm not gonna do this, but then we can um, make a prediction, right? Using uh, estimator.predict on a new, a new data set. Um, so this estimator will tell us, sorry, this score will tell us the accuracy and essentially that's the proportion or percentage or fraction of um, the uh, results that were that the estimator got correct. And we're doing this on the training data set. We're, we've just trained the model on this. So this is telling us um, the accuracy on the on the training data set, okay? So it's 90% accurate on the training data set. If you dive into this a bit more, you'll recognize that um, if we, we really wanna know the accuracy on a holdout set or um, a test set, um, and it should be probably a bit lower because this is what we use to, to fit it, okay? But all that having been said, I expect, um, you know, if, if this is all resonating with you, it means we can really move on to the d distributed stuff. Um, um, in, in a second, um, but the other thing that, that's important to note is that we've trained it, but a lot of model, a lot of estimators and models have um, hyperparameters that affect the fit, but you, that we need to specify upfront um, instead of being learned during training. So, you know, there's a C parameter here, there's a, 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 a are we using shrinking or not? Um, so we specify those. We didn't need to specify them because they're default values, but here we specify them, okay? And um, then we're going to um, look at the score now. Okay, this is amazing. We got 50% accuracy, um, which is the worst score possible. Just think about this. If, if you've got binary classification task and you've got 40% accuracy, then you just flip the labels and that changes to 60% accuracy. So it's amazing that we've actually hit 50% accuracy. We're to be congratulated on that. Um, and what I want to note here is that we have two sets of hyperparameters we've used. One's created 90% accurate model with 90% accuracy. Another one, one with 50% accuracy. Um, so we want to find the best hyperparameters essentially. And that's why hyperparameter optimization is, is so important. Um, there are several ways to do hyperparameter optimization. One is called grid search, uh, cross-validation. I won't talk about cross-validation. Um, it's essentially, um, a more robust analog of train test split where you uh, train on a subset of your data and compute the accuracy on a test, on a, on a holdout set or a test set. Um, Cross-validation is, as I said, a slightly more robust analog of this. It's called grid search because we have a grid of hyperparameters. So we have, you know, in this case, we have a hyperparameter C, we have a hyperparameter kernel, and we can imagine them in a, in a grid and we're performing, um, we're checking out um, the score over all this, gr over this entire grid of, of hyperparameters, okay? So to do that, um, I import grid search CSV. Now I'm going to um, uh, compute um, the estimator over, over these, train the estimator over, 
over this grid. Um, and as you see, this is taking time now, okay? Um, and what I wanted to make clear, and I think should be becoming clearer now, is that if we have a large hyperparameter uh, sweep we want to do on a small data set, DAS can be useful for that, okay? Because we can send some of the parameters to one worker, some to another, and they can perform them um, in parallel. So that's embarrassingly parallel because you're, you're doing the same work as you would otherwise, um, but sending it to a bunch of different workers. We saw that took 30 seconds, which is in my realm of, of comfort as a data scientist. I'm happy to wait 30 seconds. Um, if I had to wait much longer, if this grid was bigger, I'd start to get probably a bit frustrated. Um, but we see that it computed um, it for C is equal to all combinations of these, essentially. Okay. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say there. Um, and then we can see the best parameters and the best score. So the best score was 0 0.098 and it was C10 and the kernel um, RBF, a radial basis function. It doesn't even matter what that is though um, for the purposes of this. So we've got 10 minutes left. We're gonna, we're gonna make it. I, I can feel it. I have a good, I have a good sense. Um, a good, uh, after the, I mean, this demo is actually going incredibly well given um, the initial te technical hurdles. So touch wood. Hugo. Um, okay, so what we've done is we've really segmented ML scaling problems into two categories, CPU bound and RAM bound. Um, and I, I really, I can't emphasize that enough because I, I see so many people like jumping in to use new cool technologies um, without perhaps taking it, being a bit mindful and intentional about it and reasoning about when things are useful and, 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 and when not. Um, and I suppose that one point there is that Sure, data science is a technical discipline, but there are a lot of other aspects to it um, in involving this type of reasoning as well. So we then carried out a typical SK learn workflow for ML problems um, with small models and small data, and we reviewed hyperparameters and hyperparameter optimization. Um, so in this section, um, we'll see how Joblib, which is a set of tools to provide lightweight pipelining um, in Python, uh, gives us parallelism on our laptop. And then we'll see how Dask uh, ML can give us um, awesome parallelism uh, on, on clusters, okay? So essentially, um, what I'm doing here is I'm doing exactly the same as above with a grid search, but I'm using the quag, the keyword ar argument n, n jobs, which tells you how many tasks uh, to run in parallel using the cores available on your local workstation. Um, and specifying minus one jobs means the it, it just runs them the maximum possible, okay? So I'm gonna execute that. Um, great. So we should be done in a second. Feel free to ask um, any questions in the chat. Oh, Alex um, has a great question in the Q&A. Does Dask have uh, a SQL and query optimizer? Um, I'm actually so excited that, um, uh, and James, maybe you can provide a couple of links to this. Um, we're really excited to have seen Dask, Dask SQL um, the developments there uh, recently. Um, so that's Dask hyphen, hyphen SQL. Um, and we're actually, we're working on some, some content and, and a blog post and maybe a live, live coding session about that in, in the near future. Um, so if anyone, if you want updates from, from Coiled, feel free to go to our website and sign up for our mailing list um, and we'll, we'll let you know about all, all of this type of stuff. But the short answer is yes, Alex, and it's getting better. And um, if James is able to post, post a link there, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, just we've put done a link this. in the chat. Fantastic. Um, and so we've we've seen how we have um, single machine parallelism here um, using the um, using the end jobs quag. Um, and in the final minutes, let's see multiple multi machine parallelism with Dask. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do my imports and create my um, client, instantiate my client and, and check it out. Okay, 
So once again, I'm working locally. Um, I hit search and that'll, um, Dask is pretty smart in terms of like knowing uh, which, which client I wanna check out. Do the task stream um, because it's my favorite. I'll do the cluster map, otherwise known as the pew pew map. Um, and then I want some progress. We all, we all crave progress, don't we? Um, and maybe my work is tapped. Okay, great. So, um, we've got that up and running. Um, now I'm going to do a slightly, uh, larger hyperparameter search. Okay. Um, so remember we had just a couple for C, a couple for kernel. Um, we're going to do more. We have some for shrinking now. I'm actually going to comment that out because I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, if you're coding on binder now, this may actually take far, far too long for you. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. So I'll execute this code and we should see just a sec. No, we shouldn't see any work happening yet. Um, but what I'm doing here is, Ooh, looks like, okay. My cluster's back up. Great. Um, we're doing our grid search, but we're going to use, um, Dask as, as the backend, right? And this is a context manager where we're asserting that, um, and, and we can just discuss the, the syntax there, but it's not particularly important currently. So I'm going to execute this now. And let's see. Fantastic. We'll see all this um, data transfer happening here. We'll see our tasks um, happening here. We can see these big batches of fit and score fit. Um, so fitting, fitting the models, then finding um, uh, how well they perform uh, via um, this uh, K-fold cross-validation, um, which is really cool. And let's just, yep. We can see um, what's happening here. We can see we currently have 12 processing. We've got seven in memory and we have um, several more that we need to do. Uh, our task workers, we can see our, oh, we can see our CPU usage. We can, see our, we can see CPU usage across all the workers, which is, which is pretty cool. Seeing that distribution is, uh, is really nice. I wonder if some form of bee swarm plot, if you have enough um, would, would be useful there or even, um, some form of cumulative distribution function or something like that. Um, not a histogram people. Okay. Um, you can go to my Bayesian tutorial, um, that I've taught here before to hear me rave about, um, the, the horrors of histograms. Um, so we saw that talk a minute, which is great. And we split it across, you know, eight cores or, or whatever it is. Um, and now we'll have a look. Once again, we get the same best performer. Which is which is a sanity check, um, and that's pretty cool. I, I think um, we have a we actually have a few minutes left, so I am gonna just see if I can. Um, ooh, let me think. Yeah, I will see if I can burst burst to the cloud and and and, and, and do this. Um, that will take uh, a minute. Minute or two to create the cluster uh, again. Um, but while we're while we're doing that, I'm wondering if we have any any questions um, or if, if anyone has any feedback on on this workshop. I, I, I very much welcome welcome that. Um, perhaps if there are any final messages you'd, you'd you'd like to say, James, while we're spinning this up, you can you can let me know. Yeah, sure. I just also first off wanted to say thanks everyone for attending and like bearing bearing with us uh, with the technical difficulties. Really appreciate that. Um, real quick, I'm I'm just yeah. So if you have if you have questions, please post them in the Q and A section while the cold cluster is spinning up. Uh, Theodore posted in the last largest example of grid search, how much performance gain did we get from using Dask and not just in jobs? Hmm, that's a great question, and we actually didn't see, um, let's see. So it took 80 seconds. Ah, let me get this. There are actually not comparable. Um, 
because I did the grid search over a different set of hyperparameters. I did it over a larger set of hyperparameters. Um, right. So when I did um, end jobs, I did it. There were only um, it was a two by two grid of hyperparameters. Whereas when I did it um, with with Dask, it was a one, two, three, four, five, six, six by three. So let's just reason about that. Um, this one was 18. Six by three is 18, which took 80 seconds. Um, and this one was two by two. Uh, so it was four and it took 26 seconds. Um, so a, a minor gain, I think, with this hyperparameter search. If you multiply that by by four, you'll, well, 4.2, 4.5 you'll need. That would have taken maybe two minutes or something, something like that. So we saw some increase in efficiency, not a great deal, but um, James, maybe you can say more to this. Part of the reason for that is that we're doing it on kind of a, a very small example. So we won't necessarily see the gains in efficiency with a data set this size and with um, a small hyperparameter suite like this. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, exactly. And I guess also this is more of an uh, kind of an illustrative point here. I guess uh, so. You're just using uh, directly using in jobs with something like Joblib. Um, by default, we'll use local threads and processes on uh, like whatever machine you happen to be running on. So, like in this case, on Hugo's laptop. Um, one of the real advantages of using uh, Joblib with the Dask backend, where it'll actually dispatch back to um, to run tasks on a Dask cluster, is that your cluster can expand beyond what local resources you have. So you can run, um, you know, you, you can basically scale out, like for instance, using the coil cluster uh, to have many, many CPUs and a large amount of RAM that you wouldn't have on your locally uh, to be able to run. And there you'll see both large performance gains as well as you'll be able to expand your the, the set of possible problems you can solve uh, to larger than RAM uh, scenarios. So you can do out of, out of core training. Exactly. And thank you, Jack. This was absolutely unplanned. We didn't plan that question, but that's a wonderful segue into me now performing exactly the same compute with the same code using uh, the Dask as the parallel backend um, on, a, on a coiled cluster, which is an, an AWS cluster, right? Um, so we can, I'm, well, currently, anyway, so I will execute this code um, and it's exactly the same as we did. Um, whoa. Okay, great. Um, so we see our task, task stream here. Um, you see, once again, we see the majority is being batch, um, uh, fit and, and, and getting the scores out. Um, similarly, we see the same result being the best. I'll just notice that for this, for this small task, doing it on the cloud took 20 seconds, uh, doing it locally for me took um, 80 seconds. So that's a fourfold increase in performance on a very small task. So imagine what that does. If you can take the same code as you've written here and burst to the cloud uh, with, with one click or however, however you do it, um, I think that that's incredibly powerful. And that the fact that your code and what's happening in the backend with Dask um, generalizes immediately to the new setting of working on, on a cluster, I personally find very exciting. And if you work with larger data sets or building larger models or big hyperparameter sweeps, I'm pretty sure um, it's an exciting option for all of you also. Um, so on that note, um, I'd like to reiterate James, what James said and thanking you all so much for joining us, um, for asking great questions and for bearing with us through some, some technical, technical hurdles but it made it even even funner when when we got up and running. Uh, once again, I'd love to thank Reishma, Christina, and, and and the rest of the organizers for doing such a wonderful job um, and doing such a great service to uh, the data science and machine learning community and, and ecosystem worldwide. So thank you once again for having us. Thank you, Hugo and James. Um, I have to say, like with all the technical difficulties, I was actually giggling because it was kind of funny. Um, yeah. But we're very sorry, and we thank you for your patience and sticking through it. And um, I will um, be editing this video to, um, you know, make it as efficient as possible and have that available to everyone. Super cut. Thank you. Um, great. And I'll just thank add, you. If, if you are interested in checking out Coiled, go to our website. If you want to check out our product, go to cloud.coiled.io. Um, we started building this company in February. Um, we're really excited about building a new product. Um, so if you're interested, 
reach out. We'd love to chat with you about what we're doing and what we're up to. Um, and it's wonderful to be in the same community as you all. So thanks.